And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Horatio Kaufman, Director of the Dysautonomia Treatment Center at NYU Langone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to FD Day 2021, the 36th annual FD Day. As many of you know, since 1985, every year, the first Sunday of June is FD Day. A day when patients and their families from all over the world get together with clinicians and researchers. We greet old friends and meet new ones, and everybody can hear the latest news on FD. This year, like last year, due to the COVID pandemic, we meet virtually. Now, these, these virtual meetings lack the warmness of the, of the physical presence, but on the good side, they allow many more people to participate all over the world. So today we have a very busy program, and I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, you will hear about the COVID pandemic and its impact on our community that fortunately has been mild. Also about the development of telemedicine. And you will also hear in detail about drugs that we hope will correct the genetic defects uh, of FD and be able to, to treat and uh, slow the progression of the disease. As we do every FD day, I, I will first tell you uh, about the new patients. Now, these new patients are very, very special, the new patients we have this year. And in fact, they, they provide a theme to our FD day 2021. It's a very special milestone. And the, the theme is the expansion of the FD family. Now, I will try to tell you these details without using slides. Um, you, will, you will have all this in the, in the research um, booklet. So I'm, I'm going to try to explain this without figures. You know, you, I told you, you may remember that I told you last year about a number of patients from Mexico who had familial dysautonomia. Now, they were unaware of their Jewish heritage, but with genetic analysis, we found that they had the same genetic mutation that most other FD patients had. They had two copies of the what we call the founder mutation. That is a mutation that can be traced back to a Jewish person living in Poland in the 16th century. Now, this year, we have two very special newcomers. And what makes them so special is that they have new mutations. They have mutations that had never been described before, but they are combined with the founder mutation. So we have two new members of the, of the community that have FD. One is an African-American girl from New Jersey, and the other is a boy from Poland. Both were born in 2017, but were diagnosed only recently at age four. Now, for both children, the diagnosis came as a result of whole exome analysis that was performed because they were chronically sick and doctors couldn't figure out what disease they had. The difficulty in the diagnosis was, we, we suspect, at least in part, because these children had no known Jewish ancestry, and therefore their doctors were not thinking in, in the possibility of FD, uh, which is, as you know, classified as a Jewish genetic disease. But both new patients turn out to be heterozygous for the ELP1 gene, the gene responsible for FD. Now, heterozygous, from the word hetero, different, means that they have inherited different forms of the, of the gene, different mutations uh, from each parent. Now, this is what's called a heterozygous or different pheno genotype. And it stands in contrast to a homozygous phenotype, homo meaning same, uh, where an individual inherits identical forms of the gene from each parent. Now, both these new patients, uh, the 
girl from New Jersey, the African American girl, and the boy from Poland, the boy from Poland, they inherited only one copy of what is called the founder FD mutation, the one that over 99.5% of people with FD have two copies of. Now, they had that copy from one parent and the other copy, you need two copies to express the disease, the other copy is a new mutation, is a newly discovered mutation in this ELP1 gene. So, let me explain. You see, as I mentioned, almost all people with FD, 99.5% of the people we know, are homozygous, meaning they are descendants from one person, the founder, who has been traced to a Jewish person living in Poland in the 1500s, that is, both the mother and the father are descendants of the founder, and each provides one identical copy of the mutated gene to their children. In other words, the person with FD has inherited one identical mutation from each parent. Now, both in these new patients, that is not the case in these new patients. In both of them, one of the parents is a descendant of the founder, but the other parent is not. In the case of the African-American girl, what's fascinating is that the father is from Trinidad. Trinidad is an island in the Caribbean, and um, he carries, despite being from Trinidad, a copy of the founder mutation. Now, although he's not aware or was not aware of Jewish ancestry, he is a direct descendant of that uh, Jewish founder. Now, we know there were like 15,000 uh, Jews that went to the Caribbean islands at the turn of the century from the Pale at the time that over 2 million came to the States or to the US and a few hundred thousand to South America. 15,000 went to Trinidad. And then a few thousand more went to Trinidad before, immediately before, and during World War II. So the father is a descendant of one of those uh, persons that carried the founder mutation from the pale. Now, the mother uh, is African-American from New Jersey and is not a descendant of the founder, but she carries one copy of a different mutation in the same gene, the ELP1 gene. Now, the mutation that the mother has um, has never before been reported to produce disease. Now, when combined with one of the founder mutations, or the founder mutation, the combination impairs the production of the protein and causes familial dysautonomia. Now, how do we know this? Uh, how can we be so certain of this? Well, uh, we ask um, Sue Slagerhout and Elisabetta Morini and Gadi in, in their um, big genetic center in, in Boston at MGH, and they not only look at the results, but they consult these uh, databases. And also, uh, they can tell us that according to the location of the mutation, they predict that there will be big travel in the synthesis of the elongator protein one, um, and therefore this will result in FD. Now, they also tell us based on another database called Genome, um, that two other people in this large database with the same mutation, and these two people are from Africa. So, and clearly the mother of this girl, although she's in New Jersey, she's African-American and also comes from Africa. So our new FD patient has one copy of the founder mutation the one that comes from, from the 16th century in, the, in, in Poland, it was today Poland, and one mutation that appears to originate in Africa. So quite um, a, a first for, for our community, uh, and, and we, are, we, we are, of course, um, 
very very uh, curious and 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 excited to to help this little girl the second newcomer is a, is a boy from poland now this boy has no known jewish ancestry and it turns out to be a very similar story because he's also heterozygous for the fd gene this boy inherited one copy of the founder mutation from his father and a new mutation that had not been described before from his mother. Now, um, th this mutation that had never before been described to produce disease appears, when one looks at this big database of alleles, appears in two European uh, persons that we know were non-Finnish and were non-Jewish. But uh, clearly that mutation combined with the, with the founder mutation results in, um, in, in uh, impairment, severe impairment of the synthesis of the protein and the affected person develops uh, the, the disease. Now, this brings the total number of mutations in familial dysautonomia to five. And of those five mutations, three are with certainty not of Jewish origin, three of them. So, and two of those three we, we discovered uh, in, in, within the last year. Now, why, why do these discoveries matter? Well, there are a number of reasons. The first is they show that the current criteria that requires Jewish ancestry for the diagnosis of familial dysautonomia should be modified for, for two reasons. First, because many people are unaware of the Jewish ancestry, not only the Mexican patients, but patients in other places uh, are unaware of uh, Jewish ancestry in their families, but also now because we know of at least three mutations that do not originate in Jewish people. So require Jewish ancestry can delay diagnosis because patients um, or physicians do not even consider the possibility of um, familial dysautonomia in patients that have suggestive symptoms, but um, they are not, they don't tell the physician uh, about their, their, their Jewish ancestry uh, because they don't know it or because they don't have it. So the discovery of these new mutations also suggests that there will be a larger number of patients and the population will be more diverse. The FD population will be more diverse in the future. Of course, uh, we believe that should, this should increase the interest, not only of researchers, but also of pharma to focus on, on familial dysautonomia. So thank you very much for, for listening to this. I hope I could tell you the story um, and again, my goal was not to use uh, slides. Um, I, I hope I, I was able to make it understandable. So I want to switch gears now. Remember last year, I mentioned a doctor in Mexico that had worked with us uh, 10 years, more than a decade ago at the uh, Dysautonomia Center at NYU. And um, then she did a number of things in Mexico and uh, created uh, also a center that was taking care of patients in Mexico. We were extremely lucky that uh, Dr. Alejandra Gonzalez Duarte is joining the Dysautonomia Center, and I want to, to um, we'll pass the microphone to her in a minute before I think is uh, Zenith, that uh, the fantastic nurse practitioner. Uh, of our center that many of you already know. I think she will be our MC together with Kaya. And uh, you will also, as I mentioned before, hear about the latest in genetic treatments from basic researchers that are developing them uh, in the lab. Um, 
Thank you very much. And Zini, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaufman, for your wisdom and guidance. Hello, everyone. My name is Zenith, and I'm one of the nurse practitioners at the NYU Dysautonomia Center here with Dr. Dalamo. Dr. Kaufman, thank you for sharing how newly diagnosed cases in FD in non-traditional populations provide great insight into the disease and the future of FD. Upcoming clinical trials will be an opportunity for families to continue their active participation in the work that the center is doing now. Now I'll move into introducing our new clinician joining the center team, Dr. Alejandra Gonzalez Duarte. Hi, I'm Alejandra Gonzalez Duarte. I am a neurologist and an internist. I have a fellowship in autonomic disorders that I completed in 2008 under the supervision of Dr. Horacio Kaufman. I also have another fellowship in neuroinfectious diseases, and I recently have my PhD in bioethics. I am very glad to go back to the center and work with a group of doctors and nurses on, and take care of, of the patients with FD. For the last 10 years, I have been following up all the uh, scientific advances and also the social media of the FD community. Particularly, I have enjoyed a laugh and cried a little bit with the photography contest. I am very honored to be back, and I wish we can meet soon. Have a nice day in this FD meeting. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez Duarte. We are so happy to have such an experienced physician who's so highly community already returning to us. Our next presenter is Dr. Patricio Millar Vernetti, who will be talking to us about COVID-19 and how it affected FD patients. Hi, I'm Dr. Patricio Millar. I'm a neurologist at the Dysautonomia Center, and I'm glad to take part of FD Day in the second virtual version. Today, I'm going to talk about something that we've all been living with and experiencing for the past year, COVID-19 and vaccines. So since the pandemic started, millions of people around the world have been affected by COVID-19, including many of us. And by now, it's very likely that we've all been either been affected directly by it or have had a family member or a friend that has been affected by COVID too. During the early days of the pandemic, something that we were concerned or worried about was how would people with FD do if they were to have COVID-19. We know that pulmonary and respiratory problems are a common concern in FD. And knowing that COVID is a disease that primarily affects the lungs and the respiratory system, this was a big concern for us too as well as if this would trigger severe or unrelated crisis too. Fortunately, so far, we only have a record of 14 cases of COVID-19 among FD patients, including a patient that even had COVID twice. We've heard about cases across four different countries in patients with ages ranging as young as 13 years of age, all the way to 50 years of age. And to put this into perspective, this is about 5% of the FD community which when compared to the whole population, is about as half as the proportion of people who has had COVID in the US. And this is a relatively low number, which is a reflection of the great job our community has been doing in keeping safe with recommended measures to prevent infection, such as wearing face masks, keeping social distancing and hand washing. And we want to congratulate you for that, because that's an accomplishment that you've achieved by yourselves. Only three patients needed to be hospitalized for COVID-related complications, one of which had serious pulmonary problems to begin with. Another one had had pneumonia and metabolic problems that required IV fluids and antibiotics. And there was sadly one patient in Israel who passed away due to direct viral heart complications. But for the most cases, symptoms were mild and could be managed either at home or as outpatients. Many of these people were diagnosed due to a high suspicion for COVID, or just as a precaution in the context of having close contacts who had also tested positive. These symptoms ranged from mild fever, cough, feeling tired and lethargic, and some patients had autonomic crisis that again, could be managed with their usual treatment and medications. Most importantly, we haven't had any reports of people with FD having long holer syndromes or long-term post-COVID complications. Moving on to vaccines, we know that COVID vaccines are effective. They help reduce the severity of the symptoms, they help avoid hospitalizations, 
and they help reduce mortality from COVID. Furthermore, it has been more recently shown that they help reduce the transmission of the virus itself as well. So far, we've had over 40 patients with AFD receiving different vaccines, including the vaccines from Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson, and even some couple of patients younger than 18 years of age. Anticipating flu-like symptoms from the vaccine is a very normal and commonly occurs from any vaccine. These symptoms, which sometimes include fever, malaise, chills, body aches, or local site pain and injection sites, are all signs that our own body is mounting a good immune response and responding to the vaccine and the antibodies it's creating, which is why it may be more common to have these symptoms for people who have already had COVID or who are getting your second dose. We know that this can create some anxiety around getting the vaccine, but that doesn't mean that everybody will get these symptoms. We've even heard about patients who have had COVID and didn't have any side effects from the vaccine. Nevertheless, we understand that this can be very uncomfortable too, and that in patients with FD, this may even lead to an autonomic crisis. For everyone who has had the vaccine, most people with FD tolerated very well without any symptoms at all, which is also true in the average population. Sometimes when having the second vaccine, as mentioned before, can elicit more of these symptoms because the immune system is already primed to take action from the first dose. For this reason, and to avoid these symptoms that again, could terminate or ultimately lead to an autonomic crisis, we're currently recommending to, in the evening after the second dose, start taking ibuprofen or acetaminophen, also known as paracetamol, and to keep taking it around the clock for the following two to three days. Some people prefer to take the medications only if they start feeling unwell, or if they take their temperature and find out that they have a fever coming up. But if following this scheduled dosing, it's especially important not to skip any doses at nighttime or during sleep, as many people may wake up during the night with fever or other flu-like symptoms like chills that can quickly mount up to trigger an autonomic crisis. Nevertheless, and so far, following these recommendations of taking these medications every six or eight hours as indicated, has had a good results, resulting in fewer side effects, better tolerability to the vaccine, and no atomic crisis. So to sum up, we're happy to see that a few patients with FD who have had COVID have had mild symptoms and fewer complications, and we want to keep it that way. We still encourage people to maintain social distance when possible, to wear face masks in public, and most importantly, to get vaccinated so we can slowly and safely go back to normal. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Hi, I'm Dr. Kaya Dalamo. I'm also a nurse practitioner here at the NYU Dysautonomia Center. The pandemic has made such an impact on all of our lives over the last year. Of the many changes that we've experienced, one that is here to stay is telemedicine. Nurse practitioner Zenith Khan will speak about using telemedicine for patients with FD. Hello everyone, today we will be talking about telemedicine and virtual visits at the NYU Dysautonomia Center for patients with familial dysautonomia. The NYU Dysautonomia Center has been serving patients with FT since 1970, and it remains one of the preeminent international facilities for treatment of this devastating and progressive disease. Our center devotes itself to the care of patients with this complex disorder to provide each patient with a comprehensive and individual plan of care. Our center sees patients from all over the country and the world for their annual and interim visits. FD patients have regular in-person visits with the specialized care team, including a family nurse practitioner, a neurologist, pulmonologist, gastroenterologist, and ophthalmologist. And as you can see here, patients fly in from all over the country and the world to receive care at our center. Regular annual in-person vi visits are encouraged for every patient to receive the latest up-to-date level of care. While beneficial for overall health outcomes, this care model can be financially burdensome and time consuming and can create a barrier for patients who need to travel significant distances to reach a specialized FT center. Prior to the pandemic, out of state and even some in-state patients complained that visits into Manhattan were financially burdensome, time consuming, and put patients at risk of complications due to the special considerations and accommodations needed for travel. 
Frequent in-person appointments can also increase the risk of infection and even greater concern in light of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. When the COVID-19 sheltering in place order came into New York City, we had to reimagine what a visit to the dysautonomia center looked like. We wanted to remain accessible and give our patients the best quality of care possible from the safety of their homes. So the dysautonomia center had to ask ourselves, how would this look like for medically complex patients? Telehealth offered care options for patients with FD that overcame many inconveniences and safety concerns surrounding in-person appointments. However, the level of monitoring required for a routine FD patient visit went beyond what a normal telehealth visit could provide. As the pandemic had forced many clinics to transition to telehealth models, the FD Center developed a special task force to advocate for patients to continue to receive comprehensive care. In response to the COVID-19 safety measures, the Dysautonomia Center, with the help of the FD Foundation, implemented a telehealth model that involved web-based video appointments with multiple members of a multidisciplinary team and kits with written instructions and videos, demonstrations sent to patients prior to the appointments. These kits are used to measure weight and height, evaluate lung health, listen to heart sounds, record EKGs, assess gates, and look for ulcers under the supervision of a healthcare provider. Here's a video that talks about all the details of our kit. Welcome to the FD kit. In here, you will find everything necessary in order to complete your visit. Hello, welcome to your telemedicine visit with the Dysautonomia Center. Using telemedicine is new to many people, and like anything new, it can cause some initial anxiety. We understand this, and so have prepared a video to help you through this journey. Please take care of all of the items inside the kit and return them in the same condition that you found them in, because these are tools that are vital for the continued assessment of others, and your actions in caring for them are caring and respectful actions towards people who need to use them after you. Each kit included a real-time electronic stethoscope, which allowed patients to transmit heart and lung sounds to our licensed care providers, a cardiac EKG monitor to capture medical grade EKGs in 30 seconds to detect for atrial fibrillation, bradycardia, tachycardia, or normal sinus rhythm, an Omron blood pressure machine to monitor orthostatic blood pressures and symptoms from the comfort of their homes with an ambulatory clinically validated machine, a 24-hour blood pressure monitor to assess blood pressure variability throughout the day, a pulse oximeter to monitor heart rate and blood oxygenation status, an Apple iPad which conveniently was able to send all files to providers in real time, and return shipping labels to decrease turnaround time and to gather all the data in a timely fashion. Many patients expressed great feedback regarding the virtual visits. Here are some examples of the great feedback we received regarding the kits. Patients and family members expressed how the virtual visits remained comprehensive, thorough, convenient, and extremely helpful during such uncertain times. While the world was on pause, patients with FD continued to need high levels of care and attention to ensure their health did not deteriorate or regress. Among the benefits of telehealth we identified were the lack of travel time to the clinic, lesser time away from work, and reduced risk of infection. Some limitations of the telehealth visits included lack of access to Wi-Fi and limited physical examination. Over the past year, patients and families have expressed an overwhelming support for telehealth. This encourages patients and providers at our center to incorporate telehealth clinics into FD care beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. Future work will need to be done to assess the effects of telehealth visits on FD health outcomes. As always, in-person visits are open and encouraged for patients and their families to continue care for patients with FD. This model is just one example of many of how the Dysautonomia Center puts patient safety at the forefront of patient care. We will continue to adapt with the times and ensure that every patient, regardless of their geographic status, is cared for and receives the latest information to live the po best possible lives they can. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Zenith. Collaborating with clinicians around the world has always been an important part of our work. We will now hear from the clinicians at two FD centers in Israel who have been key in sharing their clinical experiences of COVID-19 illness and vaccines in their patients. First, we have Dr. Alex Gilelis-Hilel from Hadassah University Medical Center, 
Then we will hear from Dr. Bot Elbar Aluma from Sheba Medical Center. Good morning and good evening, everybody. Uh, and thank you for joining us for this uh, FD day. My name is Alex Gireles Hillel, and I'm uh, the head of the FD clinic at Adassa Medical Center. Um, I think uh, the best experience I can share from this year is uh, how we could uh, feel so distanced from other people during this uh, pandemic, but also kept close contact with the families of FD patients uh, through some more online communications. And my hope is, as Vera Adler mentioned earlier, the a person in charge of our uh, families uh, foundation center that with the upcoming how should i say the recovery from this uh, crisis we will start seeing more and more patients visiting the center because uh, although telemedicine has many many benefits uh, including the uh, opportunity to follow distant patients i think israel offers an opportunity to see the patients in person and try to optimize the care uh, individually and uh, with each per, uh, patient uh, by itself. In any case, uh, I will hope we can hear more about the pulmonary uh, challenges that this uh, disease has uh, brought to us, and especially as uh, the patients have underlying pulmonary disease, I think we could learn something from uh, the care that was provided to COVID patients and also to, uh, translated to. Thank you, everybody, and hope to hear more interesting stuff today. And now I will transfer uh, the microphone to Dr. Batel Aluma from Tel Shona uh, Center. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Bar Aluma. Probably part of you remember me from last year. Uh, before I start, um, I have a few slides for you. Uh, I want to uh, thank, first of all, all the participants, but uh, especially Monique. Um, Monique had volunteered uh, to help us with uh, natural history, uh, to put all the data from here in Israel and to give it to the NYU Center. Uh, we struggled with that for a period because of the COVID-19, but now that we are uh, in the post-vaccine uh, era, so uh, I'm very happy that Monique, that is also hearing us, uh, can help us with that. And um, if we're talking about natural history, I'm going to show you a little bit of data of the pulmonary function tests uh, of participants of patients with dysautonomia here in Israel. So um, next slide. So um, here we have uh, data from 52 participants and um, 199 tests, almost 200. Uh, each participant had three to four uh, pulmonary function tests over the years with a follow-up that goes from one year to seven and a half years. Um, next slide. Um, so here we see a lot of numbers, but mostly what we can hear, see from that is uh, we have several uh, pulmonary function tests that are um, the most important, the FVV1, the FVC, and also small airways. Um, um, next slide. Also next slide. So uh, what we see from here is that when we divided all pulmonary functions in two, two groups. Uh, we looked at them, whatever one at the age of 30, and we divided them into two groups. The one is the L group, which has low pulmonary function tests, and uh, the other one is the M. I don't know why we chose the M. Maybe M is like mitzdayen in Hebrew, which means exceptional, excellent. Uh, and what we can see here, that um, the line is exponential. What it means, that the pulmonary function test drops significantly up to the age of 20. Uh, that is with the uh, L group, with the, the one with the blue. And uh, the, uh, the M group stays rather, um, um, it, it goes down only at the age of 30 or 40. Uh, so they're quite stable. Um, next, next slide. 
Um, next slide. So, sorry, the one before. Thank you. Um, the same thing we see also with the trapped air. Uh, some of the participants were also uh, able to do um, not only spirometry, which depends on how you do the test, how you blow out the air, but also uh, volume of the lungs uh, that you do when you enter a box and uh, with uh, the difference of pressure within the box and in the, in the lungs, we can also see how much air is trapped in and we can take it out. And also here we see the same thing. We see that uh, um, the L group is kind of high and gets higher with time and the M group is quite stable. Last. Next one. And um, here another thing that we see is the uh, response to uh, bronchodilators. So um, um, what we see here that uh, we sometimes uh, when pulmonary function test gets worse with years, we don't have a good response to bronchodilators, albuterol or atrovent, uh, uh, because of sometimes we have bronchomalacia, which means that the cartilage gets get a little bit weak. weak. But here we see that even with low pulmonary function tests, there, there was a positive response. So there are two things that we can, we can learn from this data. First of all, if we take good care of our lungs, then we can stay healthy for a long period. And second is that we are responsive to bronchodilators, but it's, it's a good thing to take to check it once in a while and to see that we are still uh, responsive and we're not just getting the treatment without any good response. So that is the data that I have to show you about pulmonary function tests over the years. And thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalala Salal and Dr. Barr for your continued collaboration and care for patients with FD. Now, we will move into the question and answer session moderated by Kaya and I. We invite you to submit questions via the chat box. We also have some questions that were submitted when you registered for FD Day, and we'll be start, get started by answering some of those. Our panelists today are Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Millar, Dr. Gonzalez Duarte, from our team here at the NYU Dysautonomia Center, and from the Israel chapters, Dr. Gila Silel and Dr. Barr. Our first question is one that many families that are on many families' minds through this difficult year. The first question goes to Dr. Patricio Millar. Dr. Millar, as schools and communities are reopening, what steps should families reintegrate back into school, day hab, and work? Please share your insights on the following mask guidelines and traveling. Um, patients asked if it was safe for big groups of people to be together outside that have been vaccinated. And do you remember for pa do you re do you recommend for patients to restart in person therapies once they're fully vaccinated? Should they return to in office visits using remote visits? Um, Dr. Uh, Malari, you're muted. There you go. Thank you very much for asking that question, which I believe is a very important, very current event. And like you said, what's in everybody's minds nowadays in patients and uh, caretakers, families as well. And the one thing that we need to start with is that because there are many changes in people from all over the world in any locations, that we cannot give a, a cookbook recipe, a blanket statement about what to do. But we can recommend situations to adjust in every particular event. So again, for example, there are a number of things that you have to take into account, which are first of all, the transmission rates and the vaccination rates in your community. And regardless of this, uh, at least in the USA, the CDC still recommends that for people returning to uh, their workplace environment and returning to uh, school or educational institutions to keep adhering to five key principles, which are to continue to use face masks in closed environments, to continue to wash uh, hands frequently, to keep social distancing when possible, to frequently clean or disinfect surfaces <laughs> or a workplace um, environments as well, and to try to keep as much ventilation as possible, 
if possible, the uh, most essential to keep ventilation from outdoors, meaning trying to keep uh, windows or um, doors open whenever possible. And the other um, situation that it needs to be considered is specifically about institutional or educational guidelines in each particular place, which is what plans will be placed uh, whenever a situation arises. For example, what will happen if uh, a student, if a teacher is someone from the staff or from the workplace uh, has a contact that had COVID, uh, is infected or is showing symptoms that may be suggestive of COVID at the time? Uh, what kind of quarantine is going to take into place? What kind of contest, uh, um, contact tracing will take into effect as well? And talking about uh, gatherings, Several factors come into account as well. We know that for people who are fully vaccinated, it's safe to be uh, without masks, even indoors. And when having a different scale of gatherings, again, there are se several factors that need to be taken into account. One is the not only the number of people that are going to be joining, because again, we know that depending on each household, there will be smaller or more amount of participants. But it also depends on the vaccination status, if everybody was able to get a vaccine, <laughs> and um, from how many households they're going to be joining, if the participation is going to be indoors or outdoors. So outdoors, we always know, is much safer. Uh, what kind of activities will they be engaging in? And again, from where is people going to come from? From which distances? And this is also important because it involves travel, and most of transportation. The risk is not going to be the same if there's a family that's going to be sharing a car, if there's going to be trouble going through a bus or a train, or even a plane. And again, this has to do with the chances of the transmission in different situations. And one factor that's very important is also vaccination status in children. Uh, fortunately and recently, we know that the Pfizer vaccine has been approved for children starting from the ages of 12. But still, that's from the age of 12 onwards, not below that age. And we know that the Pfizer vaccine may not be available at all locations. But similarly, looking at that, we know at least from data in New York City that from the amount of people that have been in school when uh, schools reopened since September, we know that there had been around 25,000 cases and that a little bit over a half of them have been in students, and half of them have been in the staff, in the personnel, which proportionally is a larger amount of people, that meaning the staff of the school, that have been affected by COVID rather than the children. So it seems to be a more environmentally safe situation. So again, I think that to answer this question, you have to keep in mind the vaccination status of people, the, to keep these five key principal roles into place, into effect, and to try to ask and to inquire about in your local institutions, what are the measures that are going to be taking in place in the case of any situation like this arises. Thank you so much, Dr. Millar, for that sound and practical advice. Uh, we understand that the situation might change from place to place, and we're always a resource if you have any follow-up questions, both here at the NYU Desaronomia Center and the Israeli Center, I'm sure. Now for a question about gut health for Dr. Gonzalez Duarte. Dr. Duarte, for patients who are on long-term antibiotics, what are ways they can improve their gut health to prevent infections like C. diff and alter their microbiome? Uh, looks like Dr. Gonzalez Duarte might be muted as well. Sorry, this is a very good question, and I think the short answer is to keep it naturally, to get all the all the food you can have naturally. Um, I mean, having lots of proteins, lots of vegetables, nuts, of course, and try to get your antibiotics with the food. And then if you are getting all other supplements like lactobacillus, to take them after one or two hours you took your, your first antibiotic dose. Did you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Dr. Yes. Gonzalez Duarte. Now a question for Dr. Kaufman. Um, Dr. Kaufman, how pervasive is anxiety in the FDE population? 
what are some symptomatic treatments that are in the works to help treat or prevent autonomic crisis? Very good question, uh, Zinit. Uh, first, before answering, I mean, just to smooth things out, let me apologize for that music uh, in, the, in the talks from the center. Um, I was unaware of that. I know it was very distracting. Um, I hope that in the post-production that music can come out. It's, it was our mistake. It was done uh, at our center and we, it, it was not checked the volume. So we, with that said and that apology, let me try to answer uh, one of these questions. Anxiety is extremely common in FD. I, I would say that it's extremely common in the world population and it's even more common in the Jewish population. Now, in patients with FD, it's particularly prevalent. And the big problem with people with FD is that anxiety, when, when they have anxiety, when we all have anxiety, our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, and we, we get um, somewhat restless. Now, in people with FD, the same reaction produces a much more exaggerated response with increasing heart rate, tachycardia, nausea, vomiting, and a very uncomfortable feeling, something that all, all families know. Uh, some of them know it more frequently, but it's extremely common. I would say that the uncommon thing would be the reverse, a patient with a D without episodes of anxiety. So the classic way, as you're all aware, to treat this was with benzodiazepines and with clonidine. Uh, unfortunately, this, this is not perfect and in the long term has unwanted side effects and the effectiveness goes down. So we, we hope to start soon a trial that will be a telemedicine trial, and maybe you hear about that today, that we can use a compound called dexmetomidine or Presidex and we be able to use it sublingual, so people would be able to use it at home with close supervision through telemedicine, at least uh, for the first uh, period, and see if that is more effective than the other treatments we have available. Let me also emphasize that in addition to new treatments, there is a new treatment already available that has been proven in double-blind clinical trials to reduce the frequency and the severity of autonomic crisis, and that is carbidopa. This is an enzymatic um, inhibitor that prevents the synthesis of the transmitter that the sympathetic system uses to produce the increase in heart rate the nausea and the, the increased blood pressure. So by blocking that chronically, uh, there is a significant reduction in the number and frequency of crises. That, and if we add good pulmonary toilet and good GI toilet, those are already effective measures to reduce crises. I, I hope I answered, and I, I'd be happy to answer any more details. Thank you so much. Um, a follow-up question that was entered by a member in the chat. Do any FD patients use CBD, cannabis, or medical marijuana, or and are there any studies on this? For Dr. Kaufman. Well, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm jumping, and I, I would like also Pat and Alex to, to comment on this, because as you know, uh, Israel or biotechnology in Israel is at the forefront of studying these cannabinoid receptors. So yes, we have some uh, experience. We, we tried to do a trial and we had some regulatory issues. So we haven't done a trial. We do have experience with isolated cases, a good number of patients are taking uh, CBD um, uh, supplements. And I would say without this being a control study that the results have been mixed. Uh, some patients are, are very uh, encouraged and think that it's helpful. 
others don't see a difference. So again, we hope to be able to do a more controlled trial. But the, the point is that this is a whole new family of receptors that potentially could be useful for the treatment of anxiety in the same way that psilocybin and even MDA and LSD drugs that traditionally were uh, sort of banned because of political and counterculture wars uh, in, in the 60s and 70s. Psychiatrists are realizing now that many of these drugs could potentially have an important role in the management of anxiety and mental illness. So I, I just want to, to, to summarize that there is, a, there is the possibility of these drugs being useful, uh, but more, more uh, clinical trials and research is needed. Did, did I answer? Thank you very much, Dr. Kaufman. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Dr. Kaufman. Now we have a question for um, an esteemed physician in the Israel chapter, um, Dr. Bat El Bar. Dr. Bar, how have FD patients responded to the COVID-19 vaccine? Oh, so from the experience that we have, we were very fortunate, fortunate here in Israel to get the vaccines early. Um, and I think that most of our patients that are up to 12, older than 12 years are already vaccinated. And um, at first, well, the first patient that got vaccine uh, had an autonomic crisis. Uh, after that, we, we implemented the, the, the Tylenol of six, from six hours after the, the second dose mostly. Uh, and patients got Tylenol and from that point I didn't hear any other issues, no autonomic crisis and everyone um, did, did well. Um, I also, uh, I can also say that for some of the patients uh, that we checked uh, antibodies, we saw that there were very, very good levels. We know that there is no problem with the immune system in this autonomia and we saw that. Uh, and and from that point, I even didn't hear of any other new case in, in Israel. Um, so we were very fortunate here in Israel. That's well, really that's, wonderful. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. But let me just make a comment. I think we 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 are all, or, or not, I mean, at least in the U.S. and in other countries, learning from the Israeli experience because. Uh, I think you guys have already achieved like herd immunity, right? Like 70% of the country is vaccinated. That in the US, that number is far from that. Is yes, that the that's case? quite amazing Alex because that's true. And uh, previous uh, thoughts were that we had to, to reach more than 80% uh, to get the herd vaccination, but we got it even before, so that's great. That's great. Yes. So that goes thank to you so what, much Dr. For... Mijar was, what Dr. Mijar was saying, that the advice is very dependent on the society where you are. And um, both Dini, Kaya, and Patricio, and we are sometimes, uh, we, we may, um, I don't know if exaggerate is the, is, the, is the term. I don't want to use that term, but we want to be as, um, protective of the population as possible and to to until the country achieves herd immunity like Patricio reminded you we should continue taking all the precautions uh, for knowing that this is transmitted through through airdrops even here in yes, Israel thank we still you so wear much. Even can you say that again, uh, Bat? I said that even in Israel, we still we still wear masks when we're inside. So perfect. Okay. That was actually a follow up question from our viewers. With Israel recommending more masks inside or outside starting on June fifteenth, which is also mirroring a lot of places throughout the U.S., do you still recommend wearing one to protect FD patients further, Doctor Barr? 
Um, I think that uh, at that point when we don't have actual data on what happens when we take out the masks, so we still have to be cautious and wear it at least inside. That is my opinion. And is like Jerusalem a little... doing the same? Is Hadassah doing the same, Alex? Or, or you have... Yeah, we actually need... Uh... Yeah, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, I completely agree. We, uh, in normal times, uh, we did not wear masks uh, inside, but as we progress with this, uh, you know, COVID pandemic, we start to understand maybe wearing masks in any encounter with whether the physician uh, wants to protect themselves or the patients wants to protect themselves or not spread the disease is actually mm -hmm. not a bad idea. So I think going forward, uh, we're going to see, as we see actually in the uh, Far East, uh, when you're sick, you wear a mask uh, when you're in public and when you're uh, with a crowd. So my opinion, at least for the near future, we will still be seeing masks in, in public. And to contribute a little Absolutely. bit to this topic and with how overprotective uh, we are of our community, uh, as this is a condition that hasn't been dealt with or seen that we have data from before, uh, whenever we take new recommendations, it's always for a vulnerable population to wait a few weeks to see what the response it is to, to these measures. When I made my video, it was the day before the CDC guidelines changed. And very recently, we've seen that uh, the number of cases have continued to decline and there haven't been new spikes or increasing cases uh, because they change the recommendations. Absolutely. Thank you guys all so much for that. Um, the next question is for Dr. Hillel. Um, Dr. Hillel, how has COVID-19 changed our understanding of patients with FD and their pulmonary health? What are some ways patients can strengthen their lungs and prevent pulmonary complications? Thank you for this question. Actually, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk a bit about what we know about COVID-19. And, and the interesting thing is we as pulmonologists at first were very uh, alerted or, or uh, very warned that uh, this is going to be our main uh, line of work for the uh, foreseeable future. But we were surprised actually to see that people who had and other problems were more vulnerable, and specifically people with the blood vessel problems, whether this is diabetic patients or a patient with a cardiovascular disease. And the more we understand this virus, the more we know that uh, people with their uh, arteries or blood vessels that are uh, damaged are more vulnerable to this disease. Um, but this is as, as a side note, because we all know that uh, FD patients were not hurt as much by this uh, disease and, and uh, excluding the very unfortunate case uh, under our care at Hadassah uh, of a young uh, woman who passed from COVID complications, uh, our patients had this pretty mildly. Um, and going back to the question uh, about pulmonary status, we all know that uh, uh, there is a pulmonary component to COVID-19 and uh, the better you come facing it, the better you will come out of it. And uh, since FD patients have all uh, what we call bronchiectatic disease, or many of them have, have bronchiectatic disease, that is a disease of the uh, airways that uh, are damaged by whether it's reflux or recurrent infections, uh, the best way to protect it is uh, to clean them. And uh, as many patients do, they have cough assist to assist them with devices that assist them with the coughing. They have physiotherapy. They have uh, inhalations with uh, hypertonic saline to clear the lungs better. And I think these are the recommendations we give to our patients uh, every year. But this year has put a spotlight on it, uh, saying that uh, we should uh, keep our, the lungs of our patients even in better condition and again the same measures but uh, probably more important than ever wonderful thank you so much dr hillel
Dr. Kaufman, a question that was entered from our audience after your great presentation today on the new genes found is, if only one parent tests positive for the FD gene by J-screen, can the child still have FD from those parents, considering other less common variants have been found that can combine with the, in a heterozygous form of FD? You know, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. And you see, until not that long ago, the answer would have been that both parents have to be carriers. That, and in that case, they have 25% chance of having a child that receive the, the mutated copy um, of each parent. And as you're aware, the parent is only a carrier, has only one copy. So you would say, well, if only one, father, one parent has if the mutation, the child will not has no chance of getting that. However, and that's the usefulness of the question, the reality now is that in addition to the founder mutation and that they call the like the small, small mutation that there are like nine patients that have it and was described in in um, like 2003, there are now three more mutations that clearly are pathogenic when combined with the founder. So I, I would say that in theory, yes, uh, if one of the parents has the founder mutation and the other parent is not test for one of the new mutations, there is that possibility that a child would be heterozygous, but that both genes would be defective. The new mutations, as I try to explain, one appears to have originated in Africa and the other originated in Europe. So that's why we have these two new patients that if they would have had testing, the parents would have had testing before the child, only one parent would have had the founder mutation and it would have considered that um, they were home free and they were not. So. I, I believe it's important to test for these new mutations. How common they are, we, we don't know. Those are the questions that we asked to, to Sue and Elisabetta and, and Gadi, which works on, the, on these big databases on how common this is. But I think we will, finding, we will be finding that out. Um, so the, the answer, the short answer is in theory, yes. If one of the patients has the founder mutation and the other doesn't, there is a very rare, and we don't know how rare, the possibility that the other person being of Jewish ancestry or not being or not being of Jewish ancestry could have uh, another new mutation. Fantastic. Thank you right. so much to all okay. of our panelists and thank you to all the caregivers and patients who submitted your questions. Uh, we'll be wrapping up the Q&A portion now, but please do not hesitate to contact us individually or if you have any unanswered questions.